Well, hello there, this is Tamil, and today's topic is painting mood with weather and how to approach the light for it. Also, as a side note, the time lapse that I had for this painting became so much 40 minutes at 800 speed. So it's pretty long, and that's why I didn't want to make this tutorial too long. I want to save you time. So if you want to watch the time lapse at 800 speed, uh, I am going to have that in the link in the description. You can watch that separately. And in case you want a full time lapse at almost real time, I'm going to have a gum road. So basically, I want to have the gum road for the time lapse so that I can upload it and you can download it on your own. Then I'm going to have the brushes there. So there's going to be brush for lightning, for snow, painterly brush, and there's going to be a brush for rain. They're not really crazy amazing brushes that are revolutionary, but it's just something to save you time in case you're struggling with it. You also have the line art for the tutorial. So if you want, you could just get my line art and just paint on top or below it. You also have access to my CSP file in there. You can just go through it and dig through all my layers and everything that you want find out how I did it and it's pretty open in that way. Also, I'll have a mood board for uh, the painting that I made, like what kind of images that I found and I used. It's not going to be full res uh, images, but it's just like a general picture of what I looked at uh, when I was creating this. And before you click away and say, wow, you're going to have to buy a gumroad to understand the video and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's actually not really the case. The video I'm making right now is completely educational. Everything else is like the resources is like a separate additional bonus, but I'm going to go over all the tips and tricks and explanations in this video. So don't worry about not learning enough if you didn't buy the Gumroad. Also, I have the article in the description. It has a little bit more text if you prefer that over a video. And honestly, I put a lot of effort. So if you like it, let me know. I hope this helped someone and let's just get into it. I don't want to waste any of your time. So uh, yeah. So basically, I'll paint the same forest with different weathers and light to show you how you can actually change the mood of the environment just based on the weather. And the thing that you need is obviously a painting that will be changing as you go with your environment. And a good way to do this is to do something very, very simple. Don't go into too many details. And honestly, I suggest no line art because uh, sometimes it's easier to change the weather without the line art. And I will specifically talk about this in a bit. Basically, I focused on the creating a house. I will put it in the forest. And I know that the house is going to be the main kind of focus point of the painting. So that's why I worked on it the most. And I started off with the house. And I was thinking about what kind of house it can be and just playing around with different shapes for it. And there's not a lot uh, to it, just simple house, simple structure, and thinking about what can be added uh, to it to make it more interesting and appealing. Simply put, I just started with a sketch and then later on, I usually just do more line art -y stuff. And uh, when you do this, just make sure that you have a clear distinction for the foreground, midground, and background. So at least three different distinctions so that you can add more to it later if you want to. If you're struggling with this, just also think about big, medium, small shapes. So for example, I have uh, later on, I draw like a very big tree and then the house is a little bit smaller compared to the tree and then everything else is way smaller compared to the tree. And also if you look at the background trees over there, they also have different sizes and shapes to make it more appealing. And the base color, which is something we're going to start off with, is very, very important in this case. And I suggest you don't go way, way uh, too bright or too saturated or anything too strong for this case scenario, because we're going to add more to it later, depending on the light. So for example, if you have a red apple, but you walk uh, on the moon, like not, not on the moon, but if you walk out on the street and it's dark and there's only the moon, that red is going to be way different than if you are in a room in your kitchen and there's only the lamp next to you, that red is going to be different. And so what you want to do is basically find something that is in the middle between like everything else 
and I usually just do like a mid grayish color for this. And the other thing that I want to suggest is to add secondary light opportunities. And in short, it's basically for this case is a lamp and the window uh, of the house. So basically the light can come from there as well. And it really comes in handy. So for example, if it's really, really dark scene, you can compensate that with the lamp and the window. If it's really, really bright, you don't have to use them. So if you want to do that, it really helps a lot with developing the painting. And the thing that I started with is a sunrise. What can be better than a sunrise? You know, you wake up and there's sun and uh, kind of very harsh shadows-ish, a little bit soft and it's really bright and beautiful and yellow and oranges and all those beautiful colors come together and you can enjoy yourself even though I haven't woken up <laughs> for a sunrise that early, probably in forever, but basically uh, sunrise, uh, find good references uh, online or you can take your own pictures. Almost every painting here, I will repeat that a lot probably, hopefully not too much, but basically I start with a base color. So for here, I used orange or yellow-ish on overlay, soft light or hard light, and then just set it on top of everything else. And then I just reduce the opacity in the layer panel. And that way I have like a nice base that I can start working with, adding some blue in the top part of the sky, because I know the sun is coming from the bottom. It's going to have a lot of orange and reds coming from there. And so to contrast that, I actually thought, well, because uh, sometimes the sun is still all the way in the back, uh, some of the blue can show up in the sky and it's going to contrast nicely with the sunrise color. And the thing that I suggest is doing very, very harsh shadows. And that's probably the thing that I struggled with the most personally, because I'm really not a shadow kind of artist. I'm, I'm probably, <laughs> I'm going to improve on that, but some of my paintings, they lack contrast. So as a suggestion, add more shadows because the angle of the sun is going to be very, very strong and it's very like straightforward. And that's why it's going to create a lot of shadows and it's going to create a lot of contrast in your image. And a simple technique that I used for this uh, painting and pretty much everything else, I started adding rim light and rim light, super simply, it's very, very strong contour light that you can add to objects. So for example, if uh, the sun is coming up, uh, there's definitely going to be some rim light on the tree, on the house, maybe on the smoke, maybe on like the grass. And so that's why I went in and I started painting with a regular painterly brush and I started adding more to it and uh, fixing the colors and contrast and things like that. And at the very, very end, added a new layer uh, that was color dodge. I added a very yellow or red soft brush effect on where the sun is coming. And so that helped to bring out some of the glowy effect that the sun will give you if it's a sunrise. And the next part was cloudy. So the cloudy is a little bit interesting because the clouds kind of become very, very thin and small and accumulate. So it covers a lot of the sun. It's not going to be a lot of light, but it's still going to have some color to it. And the best way to explain this, soft shadows and very desaturated and a lot of grays and blues. I don't know why, but I just felt like adding a little Grim Reaper birdie at the tree because I feel like it fits uh, the environment more. The main thing that I did here, I just desaturated everything with a HSL filter. And then I just started playing around with the blues and grays and really just suck out all the life out of the environment. And this is contrast thing with sunrise, which is everything yellow, happy. And then there is the gloomy, super gray, uh, shadowy, cloudy day. And the next thing that I did was actually rain. So rain is really, really fun because it could also be nostalgic and happy depending on how you paint it. It's not always like sad as like a cloudy or a gloomy day, even though they're kind of similar in certain situations. Clouds for rains are usually thicker and bigger because it has all that rain accumulated in the cloud. They are going to spread apart more and because of that there's going to be small big chunks of light from the sun coming from the sky that is going to hit certain parts of the image. You want your audience to look in the middle, then maybe add a little bit of sun beaming through into that spot specifically, like a little spotlight. So the clouds will make the shadows soft, but it's 
a little bit more harder than the cloudy, grainy, gloomy day. And uh, an obvious thing, if you want to create rain, I just started painting with my normal hard round brush. It was just very thin, hard round brush. And I started making like straight lines because I'm too lazy. <laughs> I'm too lazy to make it perfect the first time. I created straight lines. And as you will see in my time lapse, I just uh, spread them apart in like a certain way. And then I duplicated them a couple of times. And then once I have that covered on the entire canvas, then I can combine it all together. After that, you can tilt it 45 degrees or anything else similar to that in the direction that you want. And once you have that set up, this is a cool little trick that I really enjoyed using in here. You can duplicate it and then you make it a little bit smaller, put it back in between middle ground and foreground. And then there you can actually make it smaller, then duplicate it again, and then you put it behind the midground. So you pick, you keep doing that until you fill all the layers and you make it smaller and duplicate it more because the further you go, the rain will become like a little bit smaller and grainy and that will sell a an idea of the depth in the scene. And here's another trick because the rain layer will be very, very busy. So you have like five or three different layers of rain it's going to be very grainy and it's not going to look good. And so the trick to here is actually just create, take that layer, right? And then you can go into the filter and to the blur option and you can blur some of the parts of the image or the entire thing to uh, an extent that you want. So basically you have the, the rain that is very close, it's going to be very clear, but the rain that is further away, the one that is smaller, that one is going to be a little bit more blurred out. And that's will even send even like more depth to your painting. Also, another thing that I added simply raindrops. When the rain will hit an object, right, it will bounce off a little bit and it'll create like little splashes and things like that. If you want to add that to whatever object that you think is going to be very hard, for example, top of the tree trunk or the chimney that I have, or maybe a rock. Maybe you can add a tiny, tiny bit of a sprinkly there so that you can uh, sell the idea that the rain is pouring very hard and it's hitting objects really, really clearly. Also, you can think of the far away objects as well. If you've ever been into very, very heavy rain, you can see that if you look very far away, you're not actually going to see a lot of buildings or objects or trees as further it gets away because the, all the rain, it accumulates in the air, right? And so it's going to block how you see that part of the image. And it just becomes more white and it becomes more gray and it just becomes like more blurry. So you don't want to put too much details in the back, back, back of your painting if there is a very, very strong rain in the scene. And of course, because <laughs> I am a lazy artist and this tutorial is already too long, in my opinion, I also added Storm and lightning to the rain image. So basically I had the base for the rain image and then I started painting the storm on top of that. I just duplicated it and I separated it. The thing about storm is that clouds become even more dark, even more thicker, not always, but usually that's the case. And the rain is way more intense. And obviously don't forget about the lightning. There are many ways to draw lightning but sometimes doing very like simple and stylized, just focus on the lasso tool. Uh, look at real images of lightning and look at how the shape is coming together. But if you want to dissect it, it's really not that complicated. It's kind of like a tree trunk and barks coming out of a tree, basically. So you have like one thick one that is in the middle and it comes down and it becomes thinner as it goes down. And then that branches out into the smaller ones and to the smaller ones on every side. Think about where the lightning is coming from. So for example, in this case, I created the lightning so that it comes down and kind of faces the house so that you look at the house more. So now it looks more compositionally appealing because it's actually forcing your image to go to the direction of the house. Don't forget that the inside of the lightning is very, very bright. So it's going to be just sometimes pure white or cyan or something like that. So the outer parts of the lightning 
are going to be the most important parts and that's where the colors are going to bounce off and it's going to affect the clouds around it it's going to affect buildings around it and it's going to affect uh, many things around it so if you think you want to add a blue or purple a little bit cyan into the lightning it's pretty safe kind of colors for that purples is more a little bit more stylized but overall those are good colors to start off with good uh, layer modes to use this is obviously overlay and color dodge and a little bit add glow and just like with the sunshine i started adding some strong light on the edges of the object uh, a little bit more blue here a little bit more cyan here basically hitting all the main parts of the image and if the lighting is very strong basically it's going to have more shadows again i would add more shadows even to my own painting i've been uh, working on this for a while so i'm still trying to figure out how to capture that shadow without losing all the details from the image that i have and if you want to think about it it's kind of like flash photography it's very very strong and it's going to leave very hard shadows in the middle and last but not least is obviously snow and I really love how snow feels under your feet when you walk. It's just so crunchy. You know, it falls down. The night usually comes early because it's winter and the air is like so fresh and crisp. It's, it's really amazing. So it really depends on the mood that you're trying to convey because it could be nostalgic and it could be cold and devastating at the same time. So it's really up to you what you're trying to achieve. And to be completely honest, the snow was one of the hardest parts to paint for me right now. One of the reasons is because snow is very white and it's very reflective and so it's hard to see the shapes and form for it. So if you feel like you're not getting it right when you're trying on the first time, you're not alone. I'm also struggling with this, but still challenge myself to create something so that I can test my own skills with this. Quick suggestion, don't go with full white right away because if you want to add more to it more, reflection it's going to be really really hard to do so later on so that's why you usually start maybe with like 80 percent white or maybe 75 and then you can build up that slowly to the purest white later in your painting and as i paint you can probably also notice that my edges are fading away with the snow and an easy way to do this is with textured erasers and i'm just using a simple standard kneaded eraser from csp but you can use any other texture that you have look at real snow and how it fades away on photography because uh, snow doesn't just start and end at a certain point because it's very sometimes it's very like grainy and it kind of like in a way it's a little bit like sand and it's going to start melting in parts where it's going to be warm so for example near water or near a house that's why you want to make sure that those parts is um, you know have a little bit of a transition for it and because uh, snow is made of small particles that's why it's going to have like that little texture to it and after that you can just start adding more snow on top and as you see in my time lapse i added more white to the snow on top of what I previously had, which is why I was making a suggestion for not going full white at the beginning. And also a good way to do uh, snow is make sure that your brush is moving towards where the shape is going. I highly suggest trying to do this and just try to create perspective by using the brush of an angle that you feel the object with. And you can really clearly see more of that uh, near the tree. You can see that the direction of the snow is formed one way or the other. And there's a lot of color variation. And an easy way to get this effect is just to create selection with a lasso tool, uh, get a paintbrush of whatever size you're comfortable with, and just try kind of like cross hatching but uh, not quite because you want to fill in more than just cross hatching and just go from for example left to right or from right to left and try to keep that same angle for every brush stroke and then it'll feel more uh, like it's actually having form i also added some smoke with the chimney with simple airbrush because adding some darkness to the smoke and the red glow will make sure that uh, storytelling wise you feel the winter's kind of cold because the harder the chimney will work sometimes it'll create more black smoke but if it's like a chill small uh, not very hot kind of chimney then it's going to have like a more gray simple uh, smoke so that's why here I'm just taking a little bit creative liberties with this scene and adding more stylization to it. 
I didn't want to paint like a completely wintery scene. So maybe it's like about to start winter, but it's not quite yet, there yet. And so that's why I started adding uh, grass to the scene. So there's so small chunks that you are going to see that I added to the scene that are sticking out from the snow, which adds a little bit more story to it as well. And also don't forget about frostbites. The thing is, is that even on dry surfaces like trees or rocks or anything like that that stays there for a long time there's gonna be some frosting bites on top and so that's why i recommend uh, looking at pictures of real life and small details like that really bring out the feel of the environment and so i added that to the tree and i added that to some of the rocks uh, later on and that really feels more cold and like it's been there for a very very long time Adding the snowflakes to the scene that are falling is pretty much the same as with the rain, except the snowflakes are kind of more smaller and a little bit more chunky at the end compared to the rain, which is like a very long and very kind of even on every side. For this specific painting is that I painted on top of my line art. The thing is, for snow, there's going to be new edges and new forms and new shapes, and it became kind of hard to keep added so I just painted on top of everything else all the line art and so that's why in the beginning of the video I mentioned that in a way sometimes it's easier to do art without the line art specifically for overpaints and so that's why I recommend doing you too if you want to try that technique or you can just start with uh, line art and then you paint on top pretty much that's it I just keep working on it and after every single step that I did you can actually go ahead and reflect on your work. And if you have all these paintings together, put them next to each other, right? That will give you more understanding on what's missing. Because if you see, for example, trees from the winter scene and you see the trees from the sunrise scene, is it too similar? Is it not different enough? You know, things like that. Once you have them all together, that will give you more understanding on what's missing on each one and if you want to make them different from each other. I zoomed out and it really helped me to see like the big shapes and what's missing. And I uh, was working on the contrast and the color corrections for the most part when I did that. For the wintery scene, I can already tell that I added too much uh, darkness to the chimney. And so for that specific wintery scene, I will probably go back and paint that a little bit lighter or just lightening with the overlay uh, layer. And small things like that are really coming out once you look at your painting as a small scale. So I highly recommend doing that as well. And hopefully this video was helpful to someone. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. I usually try to answer them if uh, I have an answer to them. And let me know uh, if there's any other tutorial that you would like to see. And I really uh, enjoyed making this. Again, there's a thing on Gumroad but it's not really a requirement to understand this material. Read the article if you want, and happy painting.